Today is Sunday, October 24. My name is Pastor Anthony, and this is a Sunday Sermon Edition of Wilderness Wanderings. These words from Revelation chapters 10 and 11, starting in 10 verse 1. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write what I heard, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. And the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand up to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. But in those days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more, go and take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and I asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. So I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, it turned my stomach sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Chapter 11, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and the worshipers. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles and they will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, Fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have the power to turn waters into blood and to strike the earth with any kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days... The breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. The third woe is coming soon. Then the seventh angel finally sounded his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell and worshipped 
God on their faces, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time, the time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm, all signs of God's presence. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This past week, our journey of wilderness wanderings devotions led us into a conversation on what it means to, to deconstruct one's faith. If that piques your interest, I'd certainly commend those devotions to you. But I get the sense that a lot of us are deconstructing our faith these days, even if that's not the word, perhaps, that we would use for it. A lot of us are questioning the purpose and the priority of things like church attendance or of belonging to a church at all, especially when the walk down the Bruce Trail brings a seemingly equal sense of God's presence without all the fuss and the mess of this. A lot of us are also questioning what we believe and why, especially in the face of the church being guilty of so much injustice and abuse that continually floods through our screens and our ears, like residential schools and the death of innocent children, especially when that same church refuses to humbly confess and seek and do the things that could lead to healing. Now, the Catholics have been in the news foremost, but the folks who graffitied the cement in front of First Christian Reformed Church downtown, they don't know or care about the difference between Protestants and Catholics. The words, your hands are not clean, were scrawled in red across the landing there in front of First CRC on Canada Day. Those words remain there to, the day, to this day. They couldn't, they couldn't get the paint off. And some of us probably have to admit when we hear that, that the graffiti artist might be right. Maybe our hands aren't clean. As members of the church anywhere, we have to wonder, is association with this broken institution still worth the trouble? But it's not just cases of abuse and injustice that make us ask questions about who and what we can trust and trust ourselves to these days. It's also the tidal flow of of podcasts, of articles, videos, influencers, and more who expose us to more ideas and opinions and identities and doubts than, than we know what to do with. Many have been listening to the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast from Christianity Today and have found elements of their own upbringing and faith journey in the history that's told there of megachurch media influence and of just uh, evangelical trends over the last few decades. Others have been reading books like Jesus and John Wayne and have found very similar things there. And it can lead to all sorts of questions like questions about who and what we've believed and who and what we can believe going forward. It also comes from the other side, not just doubts that rise about the church and our faith, but also a smorgasbord of new ideas that are set before us that we're invited to try out. We've received a lot more exposure to all sorts of information and influence to to what to believe about who we are, about who God is, about what kind of spirituality is out there to pursue. How many different influencers, advertisers, and peers stroll across, scroll across your screen or, or through your ears in a day, tossing out different possibilities for, for lifestyle, for identity, for belief. How many different truth claims or truth memes flow past, backed up with with research or catchy sayings that that you can't possibly spend the time to verify, even even if you did know how? All that to say, there is a sense 
that where we are in terms of the lifestyle that we have or the beliefs that we hold or the institutions and the people that we associate with is perhaps just not as solid of a place to stand as we may have once thought or believed it to be. That's the sense of our world and of our time right now. And there's also a sense of information overload that that feels us feeling overwhelmed and unable to really choose any sort of alternative. Slowly we become nomads and pilgrims, wandering the vast tracks of possibility in search of something, anything, firm to hold on to. Marshall McLuhan suggested back in the 60s that that's what we'd probably become in an age of electric information. Nomads, hunter-gatherers of bits of information and truth. And here we are. This journey of stumbling uncertainly out of the seemingly naive faith of our past and into those vast tracks of nomadic unknowing is the one that we've been started to call deconstruction. And if you're there right now, If any of that describes you, for right now, just know that you're not alone. How does that have anything to do with our text from Revelation 10 and 11, though, today? Well, that is a question that I have been pondering myself this week. My sense is that the churches that John was writing to were perhaps in a different space. The times that we face are, in some ways, different than than what they were going through then. But I think it's also true to say that they faced a strong headwind of uncertainty, as we do. And I think I mentioned this before, but it was probably a lot earlier in this series, so it's probably worth at least mentioning again. John was one of the oldest still-living apostles of Jesus. Many of the other twelve had already died, many of them for the faith as martyrs. And now John himself had been kicked out of his community with the churches and exiled off to the island of Patmos. Jesus had said that he would come back soon. And many who first were there to hear it probably thought that he meant during their lifetime. But that first generation who had been there to hear those words was disappearing. The living connection with Jesus was slowly passing away. And Jesus hadn't come. In fact, things had gotten much worse since his leaving. The temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed. The Romans under Nero had had blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome and had, had exacted a vengeful course of persecution and death against them throughout the empire. And now, even though Nero's persecutions were over, there was still much distrust and blame thrown toward the Christians throughout society. So many of them had to be wondering, what are we still doing here? Are the promises true? What do we believe in anyway? Why do we continue to associate ourselves with this church publicly? All it would take to get in the good graces of the Roman government, the trade guilds that we need to be a part of to buy and sell anything, or just even our neighbors... All that we would have to do to make all of that right and get in the good graces of everyone is simply saying the words, no, I don't believe in Jesus. That's it. That's all that we'd have to do. And seeing as how Jesus had seemingly abandoned them, well, maybe that wasn't as hard of a thing to say anymore. Maybe that's why each of the seven letters to the seven churches at the beginning of the book of Revelation ends with the words, to the one who is victorious. That is, to the one who remains faithful to the end, your faithfulness will be rewarded. That repetition is just drilled in. There is something at the end of this struggle worth holding on to and worth holding on for. It's not in vain. Because for many in those seven churches... Maybe it felt like it was. And then it'd be easier to just throw in the towel and walk away from the whole thing. It is to this community, doubting and wandering through uncertainty and the flux of changing times and generations, that John writes this book. And it's not just what he writes, but it's how he writes it. 
John pulls together pictures and beliefs and ways of living the faith. He, he pulls them together out of their broken cliches and doctrines and, and tired motions of worship. And he throws them all up in fresh and new ways on this crazy apocalyptic canvas that we have to close our eyes to hear and imagine our way into. For a church in the Western world that is actively and exponentially deconstructing its faith and its institutions, there is no better place to go, I think, than John's art studio innovation hub that is the Revelation. But to get at that good stuff, you can't just hear it and understand it on first blush. You also have to chew it over for a while along with the rest of the revelation of Jesus Christ that is the other 65 books of our scripture. And I think that that idea is the picture that we find at the heart of chapter 10. John invites us all to come with him as he's called up higher and deeper into into heaven and into the revelation of faith and knowledge in Jesus Christ. But it's work to follow John there. The answers to our questions and our uncertainties about who God is and what he's up to in our lives and in our world probably isn't going to find an answer in our social media feeds or through a Google search and probably not even through a DuckDuckGo search. Actually, our questions might not be answered via revelation or through reading the rest of the 65 books of the Bible either. There are some things that belong properly to the mystery of God. John hears the thunders and he's about to write it down and a voice says, nope, that's not for you. You can't have that. That remains hidden in the mystery of God. There are things that we just really won't ever know. But what canon does find an answer in the book of Revelation and in our scriptures our answers to the questions of who and what can I trust? Where do I belong? And who am I really in my deepest senses of identity? Because those questions are not questions of knowledge, of knowing things about the future or things about the present. Those are questions of relationship. And John's invitation to all of us to refresh our imagination for the faith is not an invitation to know more stuff about the future. John's invitation is an invitation into deeper and fresh relationship with the one who speaks to us through this book and who we throw our own questions at as we, we toss them out to the universe. It is the cosmic Christ of Revelation who answers when we do that. He is the one who listens. He is the one who comes to us. He is the one who invites us to take and to eat and to remember who we are and whose we are and to believe, to believe that he still loves us, to believe that he is still with us and to believe that he is the one to whom we belong in body and soul, in life and in death, even when mountains feel like they are crumbling into the heart of the sea. So how do we join John in finding those answers? In short, you've got to eat that revelation of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, which is to say, somehow you've got to get it inside of you. This picture starts with that open scroll in the mighty angel's hand. Now, you may remember from a few weeks back, this same mighty angel called out a question in the heavenly worship service asking, who is worthy to break the seven seals and open the scroll? And then no one was found in heaven or on earth or under it. Who could do that? Who could open the scroll? Except the lamb who was slain. Only he could unravel the mysteries of God's action and purposes throughout history and scripture to reveal them to us. The point is that Jesus Christ, the lamb who was slain for the sins of the world, he is the key to all the scriptures, to the whole scroll. And then we watched and listened as those seven seals were broken and as the evils that have pervaded our world since the beginning were met and were judged. And when the seventh seal was finally broken, it just resulted in a pregnant silence. 
a silence into which the prayers of God's people rose to heaven as incense. And those prayers were heard and hurled back to earth in the spirit-fired presence and action of God. The prayers go up and the blessings come down. Then came the trumpets. Now that these seven seals were broken and the scroll of God's word was opened, the message of the king began to trumpet forth into all the world. But as the sixth trumpet sounded, we discovered that after all those trumpetings of the word, no one had repented. Apparently, these plagues that came did not change the hearts of anyone. And so maybe we see here in 10 and 11 a shift in tact. stand here between the sixth and the seventh trumpet blasts, and we find the word and we find witness. The word ingested and embodied, incarnated in real people, and then lived out in witness. The mighty angel comes again, but this time the scroll in his hand lies open. It is no longer sealed up. And what does one do with the word of God unsealed through Jesus Christ? Well, again, apparently, you eat it. Have you ever thought of sermons or devotional readings like that? As, you know, something like breakfast? Maybe you should. Do you remember what you had for breakfast um, a week ago Tuesday? I'm not seeing, maybe some of you do because you eat the same thing every day like I do, which helps. But for most of us, we don't don't quite remember that sort of thing. We don't remember what we had for breakfast. We don't remember what we had for lunch or for dinner. But you know what? What we do know and can remember is that it nourished you for that day. It gave you strength and it gave nutrients to your body to sustain you. It gave you, in fact, the energy to create new cells that actually became physically a part of your body. Eating your breakfast literally transformed you on the inside, even though it was not a memorable, meaningful, or Instagrammable experience at the time. It transformed you. Reading the Bible, listening to sermons, participating in the Lord's Supper is kind of like that. It's like breakfast. Now, there might be special meals on special occasions with special people that you remember for a long time, but most of them are blah like toast. We think these things are supposed to be special. John says no. No, it's just blah. It doesn't matter. You, just, you still eat breakfast anyway because it's good for you and you know it. Jesus is the word of God made flesh, John tells us. And in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, after declaring that he is the bread of life, Jesus literally says, so eat me. And in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we find a slightly more sanitized version than that, where Jesus doesn't say, eat me, but instead says something nice about bread and wine, that the bread and wine are his body and blood, and that whenever you eat or drink of them, you do it in remembrance of him. And we're told later in the scriptures that partaking of Jesus, the word made flesh through his supper, is a real sharing in his presence and in his body. It is a communing with him and with his church. We do it by eating something, by drinking something, by getting something physical inside of us that nourishes and literally, like breakfast, transforms us on the inside. That is why our tradition has said that the Lord's Supper is a sacramental sign and seal of the word preached, because it is the word made flesh, eaten and drunk which is exactly the picture in Revelation of what we are invited to do with the word heard, read, and preached. To eat it, to get it inside of us, and to let it transform us. For many of us, that probably means a change in diet. To ingest more word or more devotional time means less scrolling and binge-watching. It means less podcasts and gaming, less news and articles. But, Maybe a nutritional change away from digital takeout and towards some good old-fashioned home cooking at Jesus' table might start to even out some of our indigestion of overwhelmed uncertainty as we engage in a more healthy and balanced diet. 
What it comes down to, it's, it's really a question of what do you feed your soul with? If you go looking for the answers to your deepest, ultimate questions about ultimate things in the vast tracks of digital information, the algorithms will smell your doubt and they will throw little tidbits uh, right at your direction. But the, those algorithms are not real concerned about what's good for your health and certainly not what's good for the health of your soul. Most algorithms, to my knowledge, are not trained in spiritual direction. So maybe try some boring fruit and vegetables instead. Or in this case, bread and juice. Try feeding those deepest hungers of your soul for, for ultimate reality, identity, purpose, and meaning with the bread of life. Try eating the scroll. Chew it over. Share it as a meal with others. Taste and see for yourself that, yes, the Lord is still good. But, claims John, it's not just a change in diet that we need. We also need some exercise, like going out and witnessing. That sounds like a tall task, but maybe it arises more naturally than you might think. Because if you feed your soul, not primarily with your social media feed, but with Christ, with his word, with his community, with his communion, then you not only become more like Christ, but what comes out of you starts to sound more like Christ too. Testimony becomes an easy question. Well, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Spend time with him regularly, and I know him not just as some doctrines, but as a real living person that I share breakfast with. I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian. I'm a Christian. My diet is Christ. It's who I am. Witness and testimony, both words that pop up often in the book of Revelation, are both words that are translated from the Greek word martyr. But in that original context, to be a martyr, to be a witness, did not necessarily mean death. It certainly didn't mean being a, a bleeding heart political crusader for some cause. It had a simple courtroom meaning, like a witness on the stand testifying to what they saw. And ultimately, the testimony and witnessing that John invites Christians into in this book of Revelation is just a simple affirmation of Christ. Yes, I believe in Jesus. Someone asks you of Christian? You say, yep, that's witnessing for Christ. That's your testimony. That's it. That is the whole of what you signed up for according to the book of Revelation. Do you claim Jesus publicly or do you deny him? Nothing more hard than that. It's a little bit hard. John brings that out through the picture of the two witnesses, which is a picture of the witness of the church. It's never the testimony of only one solitary Christian. Biblically, the word of one witness is not valid in itself. It is only the testimony of two witnesses that stands up in a Jewish court. In other words, only the church together can truly testify. If one sheep wanders off and gets lost, it is subject to the wolves. But two can stand together. And John emphasizes that point by labeling these witnesses as lampstands, which earlier in the book was the code word for the churches, the witness of the churches. But these two witnesses represent more. They are, they are priest and king. If you draw on that olive tree reference that John makes to the book of Zechariah, priests and kings is what all of us are made to be when we claim Jesus publicly, when we then become those who rule and minister in his way and in his name because we've said, yes, I belong to Jesus. So whatever we do is happening in the name of Christ, whether what we do is a good thing or not. So the invitation is to be priests and kings in his way, not just in his name. We're called to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. It's a thread, thread that runs from Genesis and Exodus, as Renita traced out for us last week, all the way to the letters of Peter in the book of Revelation here at the end, it stretches throughout. And I don't know if you remember Renita's question from last week. It's the question of, what's your parish? The place where you are in the week probably is the answer to that question. 
the place where you work, the place where you're at home, the place where you're volunteering, where you're going to school, wherever you are, that's your parish. And that is the place where you act as king and as priest, where you, where you work with agency to create and to change things and to do things, and where you do it in the way of Jesus, witnessing to the fact that you belong to Jesus. Far from being a forceful, shove-it-down-your-throat kind of message that turns us off and that has led to us questioning things like the church as a viable institution in this last while, you'll perhaps notice that these witnesses come dressed in sackcloth. Those are the clothes of mourning and humility. And while fire comes from their mouths to consume their enemies, remember the sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth in this book to defeat his enemies. It's not a real sword. It is his word that cuts to the heart, that reveals people's motives, and that demands a decision. So the fire in the mouth of the witnesses, which is a a picture drawn from the book of Jeremiah, it consumes the hearts of the hearers. Those who wish to kill the witnesses are arrested and devoured by the word the witnesses offers, which might be as simple as reciting the commandment When somebody comes up to to stab them or something, they just say, oh, you shall not kill. That's what Jesus did in the Gospel of John. He said to the crowds, why are you trying to kill me? It's countercultural. It's weird. It makes people stop in their tracks. It's a word that cuts to the motives of the heart and lays the situation bare, but it is not a violent word. It conforms to the way of Jesus. People who eat their scripture breakfast speak scripture words in Jesus' ways. Then lastly, like their Lord, these witnesses are killed. They are not spared suffering in this world. But their testimony to the ultimate things of this world, Jesus, is worth dying for. And as they testified, so they received. They are raised to life in Christ, and they are called home to their God and Savior where no one will make them afraid or uncertain again because they have received the sure, true, real, concrete promises of their faith. That's witnessing. It's the work of all of us simply going out into our parishes, our home, work, school, volunteer, entertainment places, And being willing to live as those who belong to Jesus in those places. And to admit as much if someone else asks. Given a good and healthy diet of Jesus, this exercise is doable. Might turn your stomach sour at times, but it remains as sweet as honey in the mouth. The words, yes, I do belong to Jesus. They're simple words, but they're powerful. They change things for those around us. They change things for us, too. Those are all the words that give us a true and solid solid identity marker. I belong to Jesus. That's who I am. They give us an ultimate place of belonging. They give us a community. They give us a meaning and a purpose to our work and to our days. And they also give us a real living relationship with the one that, that we can come to know and to love and to trust, our Lord Jesus Christ. You can deconstruct and strip your faith down to the bones. And if and when you do, I pray that you find Jesus there. Because any faith that is a Christian faith starts with just that simple bedrock affirmation. An affirmation like, um, like our kids made just this morning. Jesus. Yes, I belong to Jesus. Yes, I believe in Jesus. That is the Christian faith. Jesus is all that's actually necessary. And he is enough. And having Jesus changes everything else. So make Jesus the foundation that you build your house upon. Make him your diet and exercise plan. Eat your breakfast with him or your dinner or your late night snacks, whenever it might be. Acknowledge him in all of your life, because as John continually reminds us, Jesus is with us. He's with you, even to the very end of the age. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in prayer.
God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we seek to admit that we are his followers this week, may you strengthen us, empower us, and, and give us the grace to chew over your word that we might be equipped to say just that, to testify, yes, I still belong to Jesus. We entrust ourselves to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening in. If you'd like to catch the full worship service this sermon comes from, you can find the YouTube link in the notes. For now, I hope you'll join us again tomorrow as we continue our daily devotions and our wilderness wanderings. As you journey on into the week ahead, go with the blessing of God. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.